Okay, I'm suggesting that we can use uh, creationist, Bible-based worldview as a basis for scientific research, and that's my, my topic here today. So <coughs> why do we care what worldview is involved? I mean, what, what's the difference? Uh, well, here's some reasons. Worldview provides several things. A philosophical framework, which affects how we think, uh, inspiration for the research, Different worldviews will suggest different things. Uh, ideas for study suggest things you can actually use as scientific hypotheses and makes predictions of what we will find. Okay, so different worldviews give you different answers to these things. Every scientist has a worldview, whether they think about it or not. <coughs> scientists generally are not educated in, in philosophy. They don't necessarily think about it, but a person's research is influenced very much by their worldview. <coughs> and a naturalistic worldview, which is, of course, the prevailing worldview, exerts a strong influence on most research on origins. Uh, it does not allow explanations that would suggest any supernatural action any time in history. So it just rules out that whole category. <coughs> and if we're a Bible believer, but we don't recognize this, that, that influence, then we can be badly misled. We can think <coughs> we're getting uh, a balanced picture, a neutral picture, but we're not. And <coughs> one of my premises is that as scientists with a naturalistic worldview do a lot of quality research. Well, I mean, we're not putting them down, okay? They do plenty of good work, but what I'm saying is there's another side here. A biblical worldview can also be a foundation uh, for research. And so here's just a lot in the line of what I'm gonna talk about. Define what kind of worldview I'm talking about. <coughs> uh, list uh, some criticisms of that worldview that, that I hear from scientists. And then define three types of research and talk about how that works in practice. We can philosophize all we want, but what actually happens when you do your research? And then give illustrations of uh, use of, that, of our biblical worldview in that research. <coughs> so here's what I'm talking about. There, there are all kinds of ideas that could be called by different people biblical worldviews. What I'm talking about is this one, a, a, a worldview that recognizes a literal divine creation in one week of time a few thousand years ago, followed at some time later by a global catastrophic flood um, after the, the creation week. So that's the worldview that I'm talking about. Um, others may have different ideas, that's fine. This is what I'm talking about today. <coughs> now I, I've uh, I read a lot on, and about what scientists have to say about all this. And here are some things that I read in books and that I hear uh, criticisms of, of those who are creationists who believe the Bible. And, uh, I've, and I, these are not just kind of hearsay. They're things that I've read in books or heard at places like the Geological Society of America meetings. So this is the kind of criticisms we get. Uh, one is that a, a creationist world, uh, perspective results in deeply held, religiously influenced beliefs about scientific concepts. And those cannot be questioned or honestly investigated. We simply can't be honest or and, and objective if we take that point of view. And that I've heard it you know, stated that if uh, there were more of such persons, we could not find oil, coal. I mean, we just would not have any of these things. Or if there were more creationists, medical science would collapse because we'd be unable to understand things like resistance of antibiotics. Of course, that's you know, developing that resistance, that's evolution. Creationists don't know anything about evolution, so medical science would collapse. <coughs> Modern technology would not prosper. We'd have no automobiles, no computers, air, no air conditioning. If we had more creationists, we'd be sent back into the dark ages. Okay, these, I've heard these seriously said at scientific meetings. <coughs> Okay, so we'll get back to those after a while. So this is the, the, the prospect that these people uh, portray. It will send us back to the dark ages. Now, there are some very careless creationists who say things that, that might give this impression, and that's unfortunate. But um, the, the people who write these things typically, I think, do not know, do, are not acquainted with scientifically educated creationists. So now I'm gonna talk about three types of research which will begin to answer some of these uh, criticisms. <coughs> um, and I've named them creatively type one, type two, and type three research. Okay. 
Um, type one, uh, scientific interpretations that are directed or determined by a specific worldview with its assumptions. I could just say controlled. The worldview in some cases controls what conclusions you can come to. Well, here's some examples of that kind of research. <coughs> so these hypotheses are, will only be compatible with one specific worldview uh, from the point of view of naturalism, origin of life, you only have one option. That is chance governed abiogenesis. That's your only, only option. No matter what the evidence, that's your, your assumptions only leave you that option. <coughs> origin of the main types of organisms, the body plans, would have to be by evolution. And if you're going to evolve all those things, you've got to have plenty of time. So in this point of view, Phanerozoic geologic record had to have formed over eons of time, hundreds of millions of years. <coughs> um, so if you're going to do type 1 research, this is what it is. It's dealing with things that are controlled by the worldview. A biblical worldview, um, the one I'm discussing, doesn't leave you the option of evolving life by chance. Origin of life, of the initial life forms, is by intelligent design. The origin of the body types is by creation, intelligent design. And the Phanerozoic geologic record occurs, occupies thousands of years. So yes, our worldview does, um, do, does, we do all, both points of view make truth claims. We do claim that these things are true. And so um, if somebody doesn't like this worldview, naturally they're not going to like uh, these conclusions. But this is type one uh, research. <coughs> type 2 research. Now we're into an area where the worldview does not control how, what you think. It does facilitate certain ideas. It does encourage certain ideas. So the worldview gives you suggestions. It gives you ideas. It encourages certain things, but it does not control uh, what you think. <coughs> so some examples of that. Uh, a naturalistic point of view for decades uh, it's been written in, in many books that the vertebrate retina is a very poor design. Now, if you believe in naturalistic origins, you don't have to believe that, but that's what the, the philosophy ha has been pushing for a long time as an example of, well, there's no real creator because it's too poor a design. Microevolution is inherently a very slow process. This started with Darwin. <coughs> uh, you know, if you're a naturalist, you don't have to believe that it's slow, but this is what uh, that worldview has encouraged for many years. <coughs> I'll talk about research later on fossil whales. And the perspective of those who studied this before we got involved uh, led them to believe that these were whales were buried very slowly, extremely slowly, by, by diatomite. Okay, they didn't have to think it was slow. The, the worldview doesn't force that idea, but it, this is what it led to. <coughs> okay, biblical worldview. Now, some re new researchers have gotten into the picture here and found, well, this wor biblical worldview would probably predict to many of us that the retina really is going to be very sophisticated if we understand it. There must be new things to be discovered. And actually, they have been uh, a few years back. Uh, some new discoveries have shown that the retina really is an extremely sophisticated um, design. <coughs> it isn't poor design at all. Uh, this worldview would predict that microevolution can be a rapid progress, rap rapid process, because worldview, uh, world history has been short. There have been a lot of microevolutionary changes that must be rapid. Um, actually, evolution has confirmed that. I mean, my research has confirmed that. Fossil whales, we predicted, as when we saw the, the situation there, we predicted right away that these must be buried quickly. Uh, okay, so different worldviews suggest different ideas. They encourage uh, certain ideas, but don't uh, control it. <coughs> okay, type three. Now we're, in, we're, we're, we're coming down the line here. These are, this is research on scientific ideas that are compatible with either worldview. Doesn't really matter. Neither worldview offers unique predictions. Uh, no assumptions are needed. You just collect your data, and follow your data, and, and you come to your conclusions. And so the worldview doesn't matter. And this would include most of biochemistry, organic chemistry, physics, molecular biology. All these fields 
are not assumption-based. They're evidence-based. You, you follow your evidence. Medical science and technology is not assumption-based. You don't have to start with assumptions. Your, your, your evidence leads you. It, it still takes a long time to learn what we need to learn. These are complicated things. But uh, it's not worldview dependent. The development of resistance to antibiotics by microbes, that's, whether that's true, is not worldview uh, dependent or even influence. That's, you just follow your data. <coughs> All of technology, uh, the development of de television, computers, air conditioning, automobiles, etc. I mean, all this, this is type three research. It's not worldview dependent. You, you don't need to start with any assumptions. You just follow your data. So here we, so we have these three types of research. The first one, the worldview influence uh, uh, has a controlling influence. The second one, type two, it, it makes suggestions. Uh, it encourages certain things. It doesn't control. The third one, it doesn't make any difference what your worldview is. <coughs> so we'll, we'll summarize this later, but you can see this influences some of those criticisms that, that we found. We're dealing with type three research. Uh, it's really irrelevant whether a person is a creationist or not. <coughs> okay, now. I'm saying here the worldview, biblical worldview, can be a foundation for, for research. And I would suggest this can be true uh, to some extent in any of the types, but especially in type 2 and type 3. Um, it can be a, a good, a solid foundation for research. It can be in type 1, but, but people in the other worldview will not accept what you come up with. Okay. <coughs> now, what happens in practices, in practice? And I, thinking of, of people and watching what people do and how they, how they think, I would say there are, again, three types of, of research. And this, this is different from those first three types I, I looked at in a minute ago. This is, this is um, what happens in practice in how we apply the worldview <coughs> in, in what we think in science. Okay, so conventional science, that's the normal science that's done by most people. Um, so all explanations, hypotheses, and predictions are based on naturalistic worldview. Now, even some people who believe the Bible, they really are using this approach. They may believe the Bible, but they're not applying it in their research. And so this does happen. <coughs> I also see a case that I would call a semi-biblical worldview science. So this person will, will actually seek explanations of geology or other fields um, guided by a biblical worldview. This is, their, this is their, their goal. They try to do this, but when they get to the actual explanations of the data that they have, they really are falling back uh, on a process that comes from conventional science. And I'll give you an illustration to, to show what I mean. <coughs> Whereas this one I call a biblical vision. This is based on a truly biblical worldview. The person takes the biblical approach and lets this give them ideas, uh, new, new ways of possibly looking at things. So they, they accept the biblical worldview as truth, and then they make predictions and hypotheses based on that worldview. And they're not afraid to think new thoughts, uh, use the hackneyed old phrase, to think out of the box, to think of, of uh, what this might actually tell us. It might be a better explanation. So some illustrations. <laughs> one, uh, one illustration here to, to illustrate the concept. There, there are structures in the earth called evaporites. Um, these are deposits of salts, various chemicals, um, including halite, our, our uh, table salt. Okay. This is a, a series of layers that were called evaporites. They are believed to have formed by the evaporation of seawater. Now, how do we get a lot of our salt? I don't know all the processes that might be involved, but I know a lot of it just comes by putting seawater into shallow ponds and evaporating. You get, you get rid of the water and you have salt left. Okay, so, and that would be called an evaporite. Now we know how it works. Uh, you can do it that way. But these eva evaporites in the earth are very extensive and they're believed to have been formed by the same process. Uh, now if it's just a little thing like this, well, you know, it wouldn't matter. These can go for many miles, and that's only the beginning. The, uh, 
here in the in the in the bottom of the Mediterranean, there are, there are a series of series evaporites, uh, and most scientists believe that those came about by uh, this this opening here being blocked somehow. The Mediterranean evaporates and leaves a bunch of salt in the bottom. Then it fills up again with water, evaporates again. This happens many times. Okay, that's not something that's going to fit into Bible history. But that's the usual explanation for the salt here in the bottom, the evaporites, as they're called, in the bottom of the Mediterranean. Um, and that's, again, just the beginning. Uh, large parts of the Netherlands are underlain by enormous salt deposits. Um, I mean, we're talking hundreds of feet thick, maybe thousands in some cases. Parts of the United States are underlain by huge salt deposits. In, an, in, a con in conventional science, these would all be interpreted as evaporites. You have to, in some cases, over millions of years, evaporate miles of seawater to get these. Well, <coughs> yeah, that's the way you explain it uh, conventionally. Okay, how about semi-biblical worldview science? Um, the evaporites, this person would be likely to, ex to try to use the same process, explain them the same way, and hope that it can be a fit into the biblical time scale. Um, and I would say unrealistically hope that it can fit into the biblical time scale. They're not thinking, well, maybe, maybe that theory is wrong. I mean, it doesn't really explain most of these. Certainly, the evaporation process works. But is it the explanation for most of these? And um, the Bible would suggest, no, there must be new things to be discovered. But this person would not think in that way. They would just try to fit it in somehow. OK, the third one, biblical vision, based on a truly biblical worldview. The, the, their worldview, their whole understanding of Earth history would, would suggest that new explanations are needed for most of these. The, the conventional ones are not adequate. They don't work. Um, it would predict that somehow these evaporates form rapidly by a different process. And there, there are processes that have been suggested. Um, the, the salts can come out of volcanic vents, so maybe this is it. Uh, I actually heard of a, um, a symposium at geology meetings once proposing that these Mediterranean evaporates were actually um, underwater brine flows, coming like underwater salt salt uh, concentrated springs. So there are ideas floating around. And uh, this, this person would be likely to say, well, those are more likely going in the right direction for most of these um, evaporites. So that's the difference then between these three points of view. This one just accepts whatever science says. This one tries to work with the Bible, but doesn't really think new thoughts about what the process might be. This person allows the Bible uh, perspective to suggest there must be new ideas, new explanations that haven't been understood yet. <coughs> and then can follow those up with research. And I'm recommending that conscious, thoughtful application of this vision should be done. It opens our researchers' eyes to new ideas and new discoveries. So this is not something that's hampering science. It, it, it actually brings out new ideas, new discoveries that we believe uh, will come along if we follow this approach. <coughs> Does this actually work? Well, can we actually do research and, and successfully using this approach? I'm going to give several examples. I think the answer is decidedly yes. And I say that from experience of myself and others. So, first of all, um, look at type 3 research. Remember, this is the kind of research that is not worldview dependent. You, it doesn't matter what worldview you start with. Um, you can do research that will lead in the right direction. And I, w I, I see that sometimes, even though these people may be thinking in conventional scientific terms, they're following the data. They're not being controlled by assumptions. And they, they bring to view new things that actually favor uh, a biblical perspective. And for example, in, in biology, orphan genes, these are genes that uh, have been found in recent years with the new ways of analyzing DNA. An orphan gene is a gene 
for which you cannot follow a trail of ancestral genes to show where it came from. It just, boom, is there with no ancestral genes. And these are not just occasional. These are of now being found to be 10 to 30 percent of genes. Humans have over a thousand of these genes. And often they are very critical, very important genes. One of those that's, that's been studied uh, gives us our big brain, <coughs> for instance. Okay, you won't find that, you won't find an ancestor of that gene in chimps or in anybody else. It's just in us. Often these genes are things that, that give a type of organism things that you uniquely needed by them. Honeybees know how to make honey. Uh, and the genes that control that are orphan genes. They have no ancestors in any other insect. So that's a serious problem for evolution. Um, and it's being fought fiercely by, by uh, many uh, ev evolutionary scientists, <coughs> evolutionary biologists. Epigenetics, we won't go into detail here. Um, I gave a talk on that earlier. But um, that is also a new discovery that is um, causing problems for the theory of evolution. Just to, to remind you what that is, our Bible talks about the sins of the fathers being visited on the children to the third and fourth generation. Well, now epigenetics tells us how that works. Th there really is a process that does exactly that. Um, what we eat, how we live, can affect our children for several generations. It, and and if, it, if things change, then that can go back to the way it should be. <coughs> there is now a recognition that microevolution can occur very rapidly. Uh, that has not necessarily been brought about by creationists, although we have believed that. Uh, but a lot of other scientists now recognize that that's true. Biogeography, you know, how did animals get where they are? One of the th prominent theories has been that for instance, South American monkeys are different from African monkeys because the continents used to be together, and so those monkeys were all the same. The continents moved apart uh, over, you know, I don't remember how many hundreds of millions of years ago, but a long time ago, and that's why those monkeys are different. Well, since uh, the early 2000s, biogeographers are recognizing that this doesn't work. That, that theory doesn't work. Um, and there, I, I read a book a few months ago called the, the Monkey's Voyage. Fascinating book, not written by a creationist by any means. But it's talking about this new understanding in biogeography that rafting, being carried on rafts of floating debris, has to be the way most of these animals and plants got moved around to different places. Well, that fits beautifully into a, a flood model. <coughs> uh, they don't, they're not thinking in terms of a flood, but it would work better in our understanding of Earth history than, than in theirs. Okay, so those are type three research. Um, a, 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 the wrong worldview can bring you to the right conclusion. You're just you're not basing your thinking on assumptions. You're just following your evidence. Type two research. <coughs> okay, this is the the area now where your worldview can suggest certain certain things, certain ideas. It, uh, it will favor certain ideas. Uh, and that is one where we, those of us who take a different uh, point of perspective, a different worldview, can use that worldview to suggest ideas that really work in research. Um, the Permian Coconino Sandstone, a, f a formation here in Arizona, um, which I'll talk about a little later in this morning, but uh, at the base of that sandstone, it's sitting on top of a mudstone. So a picture here back in the Permian, you had a, uh, this tremendous deposit, hundreds of feet thick of, of mud. And then you bring this sand in on top of it. The mud dries out first, makes big cracks, and the, the sand goes down into those cracks. And so you have fossil mud cracks. This is the way it's been thought uh, up until recently. It still is by most people, but new research by creationists have indicated that these are actually injection of sand by pressure from above. They're not, they're not fossil mud. They're not desiccation cracks from the mud drying out. It's a totally different uh, phenomenon. And here's, a <coughs> here's one of those. You see the people here for scale. These are not minor features. This is the sandstone up above and the, the mudstone. You have these enormous cracks 
And careful study of these has indicated these were not caused by drying out of the mud. It's, it's a totally different process. The, all this heavy sand goes on top, and it forces the sand down into uh, the mud. And one of the interesting features you find is that um, this is an article from their published paper. And the depth of these mud cracks <laughs> is very dependent on where they are geographically. Uh, the ones that are right next to uh, the very significant um, bright, uh, bright Angel Fault are very deep. The others are shallower. So it seems to be related to the seismic shaking uh, caused by this earthquake. So <coughs> uh, the other people had not studied these carefully. They just interpret them as mud cracks. But when you study them carefully, you find features that just that can't be explained uh, by mud cracks. Several different features of those. OK, let's continue with the Coconino Sandstone. This is some work that I've done. Um, again, type 2 research, ideas suggested or favored by one worldview, but not controlled. So <coughs> the Coconino Sandstone, it's this, the sand formation which uh, the only fossils are fossil tracks. And uh, I began studying these back in the 1970s. Beautiful tracks you find in this uh, Coconino sandstone. And I find evidence indicating that these tracks, many of them had to have been formed subaqueously, underwater, not on desert dunes. For instance, uh, look at these tracks here. They're, all the toes are pointing up. But the animal is moving this way. OK, how do you do that? Uh, try running down the basketball court with your feet turned sideways. It isn't going to work very well. Um, and animals don't walk that way. Vertebrates simply don't walk that way. Uh, it can happen if they're underwater and the, a, a lateral current is shifting them sideways, drifting them sideways. Uh, I don't know of another way it could happen. And the, the attempts that some other scientists have made to try to explain this other way have and things that, that really don't work at all. Um, but there's another, th an another thing. OK, what if you see this? You've got to start somewhere, OK? Um, how would you explain that? Well, I find exactly that in these fossil <laughs> tracks. Here's one example out of several I've found. The tracks come up like this, and then they stop. And then the, the same or an identical track starts up here and goes up, goes on across. OK, all of a sudden it stops. And there's nothing in the sand that would tell you there was some unique thing that happened that, that, that erased the tracks. It just isn't that way. Somehow this guy disappeared, and then he started again. Well, if it's underwater, that's easy to explain. Swims up in the water, swims back down, and, and walks. And those who don't like the idea of this Coconino being underwater, they try to explain these sideways tracks. None of them have ever attempted to explain these. They just don't say anything about it. I think because there is no other explanation except that they're underwater. <coughs> so this research has brought out understandings which have never been seen by others. Uh, why? I mean, why? I don't know why they are so opposed to this being underwater, but they, but they are. Their worldview wants it to be a desert uh, for a long period of time. And so I saw things that they simply didn't see. Not that I'm smarter or anything else, but my worldview opened my eyes to see things that other people didn't see. <coughs> um, well, they're, they're the, the, the tracks do actually don't give enough evidence to show you whether it's reptiles or amphibians. Um, no, it, it's, it's, a, it's not. It's, it's either reptile or amphibian. Okay, so, and the, I have a graduate student still studying the Coconino sand, so I'm looking at the sediments. And there's a lot of things we're finding that you just don't fit a desert. Right here, there's a, a slab which we collected. It's now in my office. Uh, but this is what it looks like. Okay, that's not that's not desert dune uh, features. That's somehow formed by by water erosion. Um, and we're finding a lot of evidence like this that pointing is pointing to water, not wind. And why haven't others seen it? Well, their worldview 
makes them want this to be in a desert for, for some reason. And they just don't, have not seen these things, have not paid attention. <coughs> All right, fossil whales. I mentioned fossil whales. This is another research project some of us have, have done. Uh, in the Miocene, Pliocene, Pisco Formation in Peru. And when we, when we first saw these, there are some things that told us there's something wrong with the usual explanation. The, these um, people who had been studying this before, they had really not noticed that there's a conflict, a serious conflict between the, uh, their ideas that these sediments form very slowly, a little bit per thousand years, and beautifully preserved whales. We saw it immediately. Why did they not see it? Well, their worldview simply didn't cause them to recognize that there's a problem here. Uh, we saw it right away. Our worldview opened our eyes again to see things differently, to see new things that, that had not been um, realized. Well, there are lots of whales. Here's a, an aerial view of our first study area, about a square mile. We have about 360 whales in there, so this is not one or two whales. This is and this formation extends 200 kilometers down the coast of Peru. Um, and the whales are beautifully preserved. Here's one example. Uh, the skeleton is all articulated. Um, and, okay, what happens to whales today? If, if, there, if the previous believed scenario was true, it would have taken, um, see, this much sediment per thousand years, it would have taken, you know, maybe 10,000 years to bury this. Okay, there are people now who study what we call taphonomy of, of whales here off the coast. A whale dies, it sinks to the bottom, and then you go down every few months and you see what's happening. Well, today, the creatures in the sea, they find this wonderful food source. The flesh is gone within a few months. Then they start boring into the bones. Within a few years, there's nothing left. Okay, so 10,000 years, no, not really. Um, that's not possible. These, what, these bones are beautifully preserved. There's, there has been no creature boring into the bones. Uh, none of that has happened. And right here, in fact, is a, is a slab of baleen. It came out of the mouth. Baleen is the, the filtering device, and it's not bone. It, it's keratin, like your fingernails. And today, when whales die, that comes loose pretty quick, and there are days. Um, it's come out of the mouth and is resting right here. And <coughs> that, uh, that here's this, the surface of that baleen. Here's a cross section. You see these dark lines. That's the baleen plates, the keratin plates. And here's the surface of one of those. And that's protein. I had this analyzed by, by Mary Schweitzer, an expert on who's been finding proteins in dinosaurs. And this is, this is protein, preserved for supposedly over 12 million years. Um, and so this, and this did not lay around for many years before it got buried. This had to be buried very, very fast to preserve this. And it's buried in diatomite. Uh, this is a, a scanning electron micrograph of this material, this whitish material. A lot of diatoms. <coughs> it had to accumulate very rapidly and bury these fast. And this, and when you, even though this is suggesting ideas that did not fit with the other worldview, if you do careful work, um, at least in some cases like this, you can get it published. And we got it published in uh, very, good, very good journals, including this journal, uh, Geology. <coughs> Here's the title, Whales Bite the Diatom Dust. That wasn't our title, but that's what they called it. Um, well, she, th this, this a person who analyzed it is a Christian, but she doesn't accept the short age view of Earth history. She, she thinks it's many millions of years. But she has a, this idea that proteins or even DNA could be preserved for a long time. It, many people have a hard time accepting that. It, there's this battle in, in science over this. And she gets, it's a challenge for her to get her stuff published because she's finding proteins where you, where you shouldn't have it in creatures uh, many millions of years old. Okay, Yellowstone fossil forests logs and stumps transported into place by water and buried. Okay, the, 
the theory uh, has been, and for many people still is, that these forests grew where they are. They were killed by volcanic eruptions. Another forest grew, and so on. Many, many forests, one above the other. Well, some creationists here at Geoscience and at Loma Linda yeah, in our graduate program uh, began thinking of a different way uh, to interpret this and, and doing research to test these ideas. Could it be that these were transported into place by water and buried and did not grow there? Um, here's what we're talking about. These hills in Yellowstone Park, and you take a cross section. You have one layer after another with, with trees, fossil trees and stumps, um, buried by volcanic debris flows. And here's some of these fossil stumps. They, they, they look like they're leaning because we're looking uphill. They're, they're straight, pretty much straight up and down. They look like they grew there. Clearly they do. And yet, a uh, detailed study has shown a lot of things that say, no, that can't be. Uh, for instance, if you've got, if you got um, uh, um, hardwood trees growing, you should not have primarily pollen, pine pollen there. You should have pine from the trees that are growing there. Well, you don't. The pollen doesn't match the trees. And there are a number of other lines of evidence that say, no, something is different. These did not grow there. Somehow they washed into place. But how could you have upright trees then? Well, Mount St. Helens was very helpful here. Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, destroyed the forests in, in surrounding areas, and they ended up, the, these logs and stump ended up as a log raft here on Spirit Lake. And what happens when those are in water is that over time, these things get waterlogged from the bottom end first. They turn upright, and now you have a lot of uh, tree trunks standing upright in the bottom of the lake. And so if those were being buried by, by more debris flows, uh, you'd end up with something like we have in Yellowstone. So there's a lot more work that I wish somebody would do, but, uh, but uh, evidence doesn't favor the idea anymore that those forests grew there. So a new idea coming from a different worldview led to research that nobody else had bothered to do. Pseudogenes. <coughs> Pseudogenes are, are thought to be genes that are mutated and don't work anymore. Uh, and some years ago in the journal Spectrum, there was an article pointing out to certain pseudogenes, one particular, where you have the same pseudogene with the same mutations in humans and chimps and apes. This was being say, cited as evidence that we must have evolved from a common ancestor. Well, um, a lot of some creationists at that time and before that were predicting that pseudogenes must not be really pseudogenes. There's something that needs something else to be discovered here. And that has been confirmed by, by research uh, since that time. Um, first of all, there were articles like this. <coughs> um, to have to give a little bit of background, uh, you have in our genome, we have coding genes that, that make proteins. And then silent DNA that doesn't make proteins. It do, you know, and that's been interpreted as junk DNA, just garbage left over from evolution. Um, and these pseudogenes are part of that junk DNA. They don't work. Well, then we started getting articles like this. Could it be the non-coding DNA, that is the junk DNA, that makes us human? Those seem to be import important, those silent genes. And this all came to a head in, in 2012, September 6, 2012. This article, this uh, um, issue of Nature, the completion of the ENCODE project, a massive government supported project studying all of the human uh, genome. And they found that most of it, maybe even all of it, is functional. These are not, this is not junk DNA. The idea of junk DNA really is no longer even a useful idea. Pseudogenes are not junk DNA. They are not, they are not uh, non functional DNAs. They're very important, actually. Uh, pseudogenes, that one that supposedly was a just mutations in us. Actually, if, if there's even one mutation, it causes uh, defects, uh, abnormalities. And so the whole idea of pseudogenes and junk DNA is, is gone now. Um, and so creationists were the only ones who were predicting this, and uh, evidence has supported that. OK, one last one, <coughs> landscape development. The formation of certain geological structures in Utah. and these are explained as uh, uh, erosion over many millions of years. But um, I suggest that a massive flood event best explains 
of the evidence. And we won't have time to go this in detail, but here you have, uh, you're looking north from northern Arizona into Utah, and you have the staircase like this. You have the, the oldest rocks here, the, the, the oldest fossil bearing rocks, the Paleozoic, then the Mesozoic, then the Cenozoic. And as you go from central Utah south, one after another, groups of these just end. And they don't end because they had not been deposited elsewhere. See, these dotted lines show apparently these used to all continue far down to the south. They've, they've been removed by erosion. And here you can see, see the uh, Vermilion Cliffs. That's these, the white cliffs right here. The gray cliffs are, are right in here, and the pink cliffs. Okay, this is looking north into Utah. How do you erode something into this shape? Um, rivers. Rivers are believed to be the cause of, of major, most, most of our erosion. Um, but, but a river doesn't make a staircase. When you have a river eroding an area, you have a hillside or a cliff on both sides, not just on one side. Rivers don't do this. So how do you, carve, how do you erode something like this? Uh, and it's much bigger than that. Uh, this, this um, is the classic description of what I call the classic grand staircase, which is right here. But really, if you study the geologic map, is the, the staircase starts up here in northern Utah and goes all the way to central Arizona. Here's a cross section. And these layers, one after another, drop out. There's a little disruption here, a, a bubble. But it's all the same process. So that grand staircase goes uh, from northern Utah to central Arizona. So how do you carve that? Well, it's a tough thing uh, in, in, in conventional geology. Um, and actually, a massive catastrophic water flow is a hypothesis that best explains the data. Of course, if you're doing type one research, your worldview controls what you can conclude. And they will not, that point of view will not accept this. But if, you're, if you open your mind and put your assumptions aside, this is the idea that best fits um, the data. And it's one that, that the biblical worldview would suggest, would recommend, would encourage. And it actually is the best uh, explanation. <coughs> OK, come back to that, to assumptions versus evidence. Um, OK, type one research is determined by a specific worldview. The criticisms is our, our biblical worldview forces us to believe certain things. Well, both major worldviews make truth claims. Truth claims from firmly held assumptions held by faith. That's both worldviews do that. How is it going? Which is fitting the evidence best? That's the question we, we can ask. And we, um, I've shown you cases where we, if we take, make, take the right worldview, it leads to predictions and hypotheses that work, that can move us in the right direction. <coughs> So type one research, origin of life, how's it going? Well, the theory that life originated by naturalistic processes has no real evidence going for it. It really has nothing going for it. Um, so it's not going too well there. The evidence for the evolutionary origin of major groups of animals, the major body plans. So what's going on there? Which one, which worldview and which truth claim is doing better? Well. This one, the evolutionary origin, is running into more and more problems, which we, we could spend the, all day now talking about those. It's not going well, um, going very badly, actually. Okay, shortage geo in geology, we got don't have enough of us working. We're not making as fast progress, but we are making progress. Positive evidence is growing uh, for, for um, rapid processes, not uh, millions of years. So there is encouragement. We still have an awful lot, uh, a long ways to go yet. But we're making progress. <coughs> so um, this criticism now, that, that, cr that creation or religion results in deeply held religiously influenced beliefs um, that cannot be honestly questioned or investigated. Both worldviews make these truth claims. They can be honestly investigated, even if deeply held. We can investigate them. Um, and we will see which truth claims hold up in the long run. So that's kind of where we, where we stand on this. Um, the idea that religious persons could not find oil and coal 
those are not worldview dependent ideas. Those are type three research. Uh, they're this technology. Uh, anybody could, could uh, do the kind of research to find those. And you don't even need to know how old the rocks are to find oil or, or coal. So that's not a, not a realistic criticism. Um, medical science would collapse. Well, that's again type two or type three research. Does not depend on worldviews. So that's not a valid criticism. Um, the biomedical knowledge needed is compatible with belief in any worldview. Medical, many medical scientists are certainly are biblical creationists. So even if they're not, this is not worldview dependent research. So that's not a valid criticism. And this, they would have no automobiles, computers, air conditioning. That's really wildly unrealistic. That's all technology type three, non-worldview dependent work. And so that kind of criticism it does not have anything to it, whatever. So <coughs> successful science depends on quality, thoughtful, informed research by everyone. Um, and if different approaches to scientific questions is encouraged, I maintain that those different perspectives will help us ensure that important questions are not being overlooked. Different points of view will see different things, which the other side will miss. And so if we, if we all work together, uh, we can keep from overlooking uh, important questions. Science will be better informed and more successful. Um, so <clears throat> that can all result, result in scientific progress. And so as long as there is a commitment to quality informed work, that's the key, not our worldview. Uh, we have, if we have quality informed work, Interaction between real world views in science can improve the success of science. So um, rather than leading us back into the dark ages, um, we can make more progress if we all work together and if we, if we um, value each other. Thank you. I, uh, and you've touched on a, a especially your last point here of uh, quality infor informed study that this mm -hmm. uh, has been a problem on both sides, uh, but uh, it's, it's not something that uh, either side has a particular dominance yeah. in. I mean, it, it's, it's widespread, mm -hmm. this type of thing. The uh, what I what I uh, wonder about is uh, when we look at the quality research, are we not uh, left with strong enough evidence that we don't have to say well, my world worldview is just a point of faith? Uh, there's sufficient evidence out there for me to believe that uh, the Bible and creation is correct. And I, I would say, you know, you can follow a line of reasoning such as origin of life. Uh, that, that's, that's an impossible situation for evolution. Mm -hmm. And the other factors you mentioned are so, so good. Uh, you know, the absence of fossils. And, and you go out there and look at those layers, folks, and I, I've repeated this to you many times here. Uh, it's a different situation, a different situation that fits so much better with the flood model than it does with the uh, evolutionary model that you're kind of uh, forced, uh, I think, into this. Now, you're facing the tremendous bias of the scientific literature, which has its worldview, which will not recognize the biblical model. And, of course, uh, you're kind of overwhelmed by this if you aren't careful uh, and if you don't distinguish between uh, conclusions. There's so much good hard data out there that supports the, uh, the biblical view that uh, I, I think uh, it's not just a matter of faith, at least for, for me. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that, that's just a <laughs> little you, addition You've done decade, decades of good research which has brought you to this point. Now, how did you get there? Because you, you believe by faith that God is real and that you can trust the Bible. And because you, you accepted God's existence by faith, 
that gave you the insights that allowed you to find all this great data? Uh, I suppose, uh, I think you know, take somebody like Anthony Flew, for instance. Uh, why did he come to the idea that there was a God? It was the data that convinced him. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't a blind faith decision first. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of, there's increasing evidence going the right direction. And I, I recognize that as well. But, but most scientists accept by faith that there's no God or no creation at least. We accept by faith that there is a God. Every, everybody starts with something that they take by faith. Um, and yeah, there's increasing evidence. But for most people, the evidence is, is not enough. I mean, and where do you, even those, even Anthony Flew, okay, the research that led him to accept um, creation, the intelligent design, but who's doing most of that intelligent design work? People who, many of them, not all, but many of them believe in God, and that's what leads them to think that there is intelligent design. Now you can, the evidence will help you, especially with increasing evidence we have now. But, but we all go back in one way or another to something we take on faith, and that's where our foundation comes from. And I, it, it's a lot of these kind of things I've talked about. People who are not mm -hmm. starting from that point of view did not notice these mm -hmm. things. And that, that may not be always. You know, whether you can actually come to this, to the right conclusion, just by the evidence, I mean, maybe you can. But generally, it doesn't happen. I suspect that Paul... Romans 1.20, when he said God's eternal power and are clearly seen through the things that are made. Uh, I mean, it's, it's impossible yeah, to think that all this organization came about by itself. It's well, self, I, it's self evident. I, I agree, but but Paul, you know, I don't know. He, he didn't have a bunch of evolutionists beating him over the head, um, so I don't know. <laughs> Um, yeah, the the level it's gotten to, it's getting pretty ridiculous, you know. It's just stubborn, like a little kid in a sandbox wanting to just say no, yeah. <laughs> not wanting to admit the obvious. But like with those, the, the steps there, I was just, my question was, um, the, the, the dotted lines, that's their assumed uh, well, actually, there, there's good reason to think it. I mean, it's assumed, but there's good reason to think that. As those layer, yeah. those beds come south, they don't get thinner yeah. until they finally disappear. Some yeah. of them are actually getting thicker, and then all of a sudden they're gone. Or so they could find them on the other side of the canyon or well, something. Well, some, some of it you do find on the yeah. other side of the canyon. And so it, it's, it's kind of self-evident that they at least yeah. went a long ways, just how far... We don't know, but they, well they there, could have gone all the way south. Well, there was one I noticed, you know, you were just kind of guessing. You'd make fairly straight dotted lines, but one was, I noticed, was kind of a hump. Well that the reason for that is okay. that that whole area has, has been uh, folded upward, and that's why there's that hump. Yeah, I was wondering about land left and some of those other things. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting questions to be asked there. A lot of uh, questions. Just want to say I really appreciate this. It's Thank you. Good. I, I would suggest that there's there's just a world of new things to be discovered. If you open your, let the Bible open your eyes no, to, to see things in a new way. Yeah. If I can ask, um, it seems to me that your classification is pretty good, but uh, there's a couple of things that occasionally you'll get a cross between a type 1 and a type 2. Well, that could be. Where, for example, uh, with the Yellowstone Fossil Forest, for a, a believer in long ages, it's a type 2. Mm -hmm. It's influenced but not demanded. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that, uh, that it's now sort of generally accepted that this was done all by, uh, uh, by a process that could be fairly rapid uh, hasn't st uh, changed anybody's mind about the general uh, age of the uh, of life on earth uh, and so from the point of view of the evolutionist you're actually looking at a type 2 rather than a type 1 I would whereas call it a, a creationist 
it's starting to get close to type one. You know, 300,000 years, and um, uh, and you've got to fit that into a uh, flood model, and that that gets pretty difficult. And I think that I think that the uh, the impetus from a creationist point of view is closer to type one than type two. That's probably true. Yeah. And then the, the other one that I can think of right off the bat is carbon-14 dating, where um, finding carbon-14 in fossil material for a creationist is type two. I mean, it could be there, it could not be there. I, I don't think that uh, the worldview dictates that. And in fact, I wrote a paper stating that specific point. Uh, on the other hand, for an evolutionist, it's really pretty close to type one. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's a good point. And, uh, you know, this I just gave you a summary, but these kind of things, you're typically not going to be able to draw a nice fine line between them. But these are categories which can have some overlap and some variation. Oh, I was, the uh, other question was, what do they say about these steps? Because they could just ignore it and pretend they don't exist, which is pretty ridiculous. Well, or they're just going to have to say, well, we don't know, <laughs> which can, sounds kind of dumb. So they probably just rather ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. Well, I guess. From, from, some, from what I've read, I haven't, you know, I want to study more deeply into this, but they, they seem to be struggling how to explain it. Uh, I think in uh, the kind of discussion we've been having, it's very important to define terms. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's very important to avoid oversimplifying something that's very complex. And I think uh, that suggesting that the influence of worldviews on belief and practice is confined to a creationist worldview versus a naturalistic worldview doesn't give an adequate account historically of what's happened, say, within church history to faith and belief or what's happened in science in relation to cosmology and biology and paleontology and so on. Um, for example, uh, you mentioned the influence of worldview on scientific research, on uh, hypotheses and predictions and verifications and outcomes and so on. We need equally to recognize that worldviews have had a profound influence on theologians in terms of their Absolutely. interpretation of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And you can't speak of the, uh, a Bible worldview. There are actually a long series mm -hmm. of biblical views. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the history of Adventism itself, if you go back to the period right after the Civil War up until about 1920, the church almost split over two world views in the interpretation of the Bible that was taken on the one hand by Ellen G. White and on the other hand by John Harvey Kelly, uh, uh, Kellogg, I mean, which finally resulted in Kellogg being pushed out of the movement. But he held a doctrine that the Bible taught that God was imminent in nature and worked in a continuing process of creation where Ellen G. White held it, God was transcended above nature, and it yeah. brought it in. More the point of view that you yeah. have presented. Yeah, this can apply in many different areas, and, and I, I just talked about this one in particular. Uh, you, and it can apply, I, I know, I think of a friend who studied physiology of insects, and he ran into a worldview problem and how the insect heart works, and he was not able to get something published because it even in spite of his good data, because it ran into somebody else's ideas. So, yeah, you, you can apply in many different ways. And as far as the biblical worldview, I, I mean, I'm taking a particular understanding of the Bible, and um, that's what I'm talking about. Others may, may differ. I would add to that that the prevailing worldview, I think, that's held, and, and this was explored earlier by Dr. Geib here. By the way, there, we have some CDs here if you want them uh, with some of this research was a worldview that's very close to what was called Platonism, which Augustine mm -hmm. refined, and then later one close to Aristotelianism, which Thomas Aquinas refined. And that's prevailed to some extent right down to the present yeah. day. The, the two-level world, mm -hmm. natural and supernatural, 
comes really from Platonism and Neoplatonism and wasn't inherent in Hebrew cosmology. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd like to thank you for coming, and uh, I particularly appreciate the idea that uh, rather than hiding <coughs> behind our worldview, that we should take it out in the open and start working with it. Right. Um, it kind of reminds one of the parable of the talents, where we've been given stuff, and rather than burying it in the ground, we should yeah. actually take it out mm -hmm. and trade on it. Right. <laughs>